Good morning, everyone. Let's take our hymn so, uh, sheet, uh, look at hymn number 63. Take the name of Jesus with you. Let's stand as we sing. Let's open in a word of prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, what a joy it is that we are able to take your name with us wherever we go. Where we can stand in a crowd different, complete, because of you. Lord Jesus, thank you for filling the void in our lives and our hearts that only you can fill, Lord. Thank you for giving us yourself. May today be a gift to you as we sing these songs, just like take the name of Jesus with you and the songs that are coming in a little bit, Lord. May they bless your heart because we are singing it with a joyful noise. As we learned last week, may we truly be filled with joy. May it not be just one day a week, but every day of our lives, Lord. May we praise your name and glorify you for how awesome and how good you are to us, Lord. May everything that is done today glorify you and please you. Be with Pastor as he brings your message in a moment, Lord. Give him the strength and the courage he needs to proclaim your word. May you do so with boldness. And may it impact us, Lord. May we allow the word to drive deep into our hearts and bring out things that you are asking us to address. Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for what you do for us. In your name I pray, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. As you're, I wanna welcome you. Thank you so much for being here in uh, the church property. As you noticed, as you pulled in the driveway, we have a brand new driveway and thank you so much to uh, 
for their Bill Dietz as he uh, worked so hard in making it possible and for many of you who played a part in making it possible so we can have a brand new driveway and we don't have a lake right in front of the garage anymore that we have to drive through. So uh, we do want to praise the Lord and thank him for making everything happen and making it in such a lower budget than we were expecting through the materials being gifted through members of the church and uh, the equipment given um, for us to use. Just want to thank you all for... Uh, your parts and making it possible. So um, as you see the caution tape area underneath the tree, for those of you who do like to camp out underneath the tree, we're gonna have to hold off on that for a little bit as there's new seed coming up. So we thank you so much, but we are, do thank we thank the Lord for the umbrellas that we have. We can sit at least underneath a little bit of shade. So, all right, that does it. Um, Brother Paul's gonna come with our next song. Thank you. Turn over to pay, uh, hymn number 514. We're marching to Zion. We'll sing the first, second, and last verse, please.
Let's turn over to hymn number 222. There is a fountain. We'll sing first, second, and last on that. Number 222. Good morning. Y'all can hear me okay? All right. It's kind of difficult with different speakers constantly moving and property and all those things. It's nice when your sound system can just be set and then you forget about it. Behold, these are not the days we live in. All right. Glad to see you all. Thank you so much for praying. Some of you may have been speculating or wondering. Yes, I had... COVID a second time. It was so much fun the first time. I thought I would try it out again. The second time for me wasn't nearly as bad as the first, but it's just a different illness and it manifests itself in different ways in different people. And for me, it's just the drain afterward takes a while to wear off. But thank you for your prayers doing well. And the family in Wisconsin that had contracted it, they are doing much, much better as well. And there were a lot of people that easily could have gotten it that haven't yet, and God protected them, and we're thankful for that. If you have your Bibles, would you please take them, turn to Ephesians chapter 3. As you're turning there, I want to take care of a couple more announcements. I just want to add a little bit to uh, Pastor Matt's update on the driveway. I know that he was being careful because we don't like to embarrass people, 
But you know, Scripture makes it very clear that when right has been done, use that as an example. And I think that this past time, obviously the, the work that Pastor Matt and Brother Bill put in here on this driveway is, is the obvious sacrifice that everyone thinks, you know, I don't have time to make that one. But uh, we wouldn't have really been able to do this. And Pastor Matt hinted at the affordability. Uh, here, Brother Dave just got done with the knee surgery. So you'd say he's the last guy that should be playing with the driveway. And you'd be right, he is. And yet, what a key component. It was a friend that he has because he remains church-minded. It's a friend that he has that had crushed uh, asphalt and crushed concrete. And so he called him, hey, can we get some more of that stuff? And man, the guy didn't just deliver it. I mean, he delivered. And we were talking about having to put a couple thousand dollars into this, and it was only a few hundred dollars. Also, Brother Dave let us use his tractor. If anything bad happened to it, it's all Brother Bill's fault, not the church's fault. And I, I, I just say this, I don't mean to embarrass him, but I know he's got broad shoulders. He can take me talking about him for just a second. Y'all be creative about serving Jesus. Maybe you can't do this or you can't do that, but ask, what do I have to give? Because after today's message, I think you're going to wish that you were giving him more than you are right now. Now, the other announcement is a chance to serve. We are going to be restarting expeditions. We're going to do a delayed start. Normally, I think it would be up and running about now or really close to now. And Brother Adam came to me and said, Pastor, what do you think? I said, well, the kids are back in school, so why can't we? And so we're just taking it on a family by family basis. Some are comfortable with being here and some aren't. And we thought, let's, let's offer it. Same as we did with Faith Bible Institute. We went back to the building and those that are comfortable can and those that aren't won't. And so we're just trying to refocus, kind of get recentered around the building. Yeah, we do outdoor services, but I hope you're getting prepared to, to us transitioning back to normal. And just know this, and I want to talk about this. You'll hear me say this many times over the next several weeks. If you don't feel well, stay home. I mean, if you don't feel well, stay home. Say, well, I don't have a fever and I don't have a positive COVID test. Whatever it is, stay home and rest. It's okay. We're not a ministry and we're not in a place where you're in trouble with me if you stay home because you're sick. Stay home. And that will be really important in the days to come, that as we return, if you're not feeling well, you might feel a little off, stay home. If you're having a hard time with that, you say, man, I feel really bad about, about staying home. Reach out to me and tell me you are. It'll help you feel better because all you're going to hear from me is thank you. Thank you for staying home, all right? So as we get back into normal routine, it's very critical that we continue to remain selfless toward each other. So with that said, Brother Adam actually reached out to our experienced staff, the ones that have already been serving and he's reached out to the families, but he's only gotten back about half of people that he sent to that have actually responded. And so to those of you that have received a message from him, would you please respond to him or talk to him today? I know it's probably one of those things, you just forget about it. And so he's here, Brother Adam is sitting right here in the middle next to Carrie. And uh, by the way, they don't get paid to do this. They don't have kids in the program. They just love the children in our ministry and this is how they serve Jesus. And so let's honor this family by replying if he's asking. If you're not able to do it, it's okay. Tell us. It's not a problem. It's probably more of a problem if we don't ever hear because we don't know what to expect. And so you reach out to Adam if you've already been contacted. And if you haven't been contacted and you're interested or willing to be a part, you know, you weren't before, but you can now, would you please talk to Brother Adam or myself at any time and say, hey, tell me more about expeditions We'd be happy to tell you about our midweek Wednesday program that's, uh, I think it's at 7 o'clock Wednesdays, starts at 7 and uh, goes to 8.30. So we won't be running the van route. I think that just creates a little too much complication and a little too closed of an environment. But uh, we do plan on getting expeditions started up. So if you have questions, you can see Brother Adam or myself if you choose not to participate. That's okay. That's fine. If you want to let us know, that's okay. But don't complain that we are. We're just offering it to those that are comfortable with it, okay? We're not forcing anybody's hand. And I think if we keep that gracious spirit toward each other, we just might survive all of this, all right? 
Ephesians chapter 3. Let me see. Pastor Matt, was that all of them? Yes, sir, it was. Okay, good. He and I talked about announcements. He said, man, there are moving parts today. I'm actually going to go ahead and use the stool today as well. Ephesians chapter 3. Have you ever been burned by hoping for something before? You hope and you really want it to be, but then it doesn't end up being. Maybe you think of a present that you were expecting. It was the right size, the right shape. You open it up. It was nothing like you're expecting. Grandma buys you a present, kids, and you open it up, and it's socks and underwear and T-shirts. You're like, man, that's what happens when you, when you get too excited about something. I had a friend who says that all the time. Whenever there's disappointment, he goes, well, expectations were way too high. If you don't ever expect and you don't ever get excited, you'll never be disappointed. I was working in the shop years ago, and I was in my last year. I could see the light at the end of the tunnel. I'd been working full-time in the factory for five years. I was a married student, and if I, if I buckled down hard and took a very heavy course load, I could finish in two semesters. And my dad came to me, and he said, how close are you to finishing? I said, well, if I don't finish these two semesters, I'll have an entire year more in addition to this year because of the way that classes are only offered seasonally and I can't take them in the summertime. He said, so there's a possibility for you to finish. I said, yeah, he goes, what would have to happen? I said, dad, I just can't, it's too many credits. And he said, well, what if you were to take out loans? And I said, dad, I don't, I don't wanna take out any loans. I'm trying to do this debt free. And he goes, son, it's time to finish and it's time to move on to the next step. The Lord needs you in the ministry. Your mother and I have talked about it. That debt will be ours. You finish. And so I went ahead and took out two student loans for each semester and took, uh, I believe it was 19 credits and 20 credits and finished out the year as a married student working in a factory. But what I did was I changed my hours from 40 hours a week to 32 hours a week. And by just changing eight hours, I was able to take that course load and finish early. So when I came to work and the bosses had handed out the very first Christmas bonus in our company's history, I was excited to find out that it was a $500 no strings attached check that each guy was getting. It was a gift from the company. And so someone came to me and they said, did you hear about the bonus? I said, I heard about the bonus. You're like, well, did you get yours? They said, no, I didn't get mine yet. I don't know if I'm going to get one because I had seen my supervisor. He didn't give me anything. And um, so I, I said, I don't, I don't know that I'm going to get something. I'm part time. They said, you're not part time. You work like almost 40 hours a week. I said, but I don't work 40 hours a week. I'd been in the shop for years. I knew the way things worked. After a while... Most of the office staff was gone. I finally thought, you know what, I'll just go ask the supervisor if I get one. So I, I went up to him in his office. He was real nervous. And I said, hey, Steve, all the guys are talking about bonus checks. Do I get one? He goes, oh, yeah, you, you got one. And I said, where is it? He goes, oh, it's, in, it's here. It's in my drawer. And he opens up the drawer, and it's literally the only envelope sitting in this drawer. Like you could tell he had avoided this moment. And I said, oh, thanks. And he goes, there you go. And he walked away, left, so that I couldn't talk to him. Well, you can just about imagine what's coming. I, did, I didn't get $500 like everybody else. And I had run this in my mind. Like, okay, they, they work 40 hours. I work 32, so it's probably a 10%, maybe 25% discount. That's fine. 400 bucks would still be really nice for Christmas. I can actually get Cherry something nice. I opened up that envelope. And you guys, there was a $50 check in it, one-tenth of what everyone else had gotten. Have you ever been disappointed by hope? I had to go through a little bit of a process where the Holy Spirit got a hold of my heart. And I ended up having to go to the owner of the company that same evening before he left and to thank him and apologize and say, I had a bad attitude, but that's $50 I didn't deserve. And I remember how shocked he was because I think he expected me to go into his office and yell but um, hope is one of those things. If you've, ever been, if you've ever been burned by hope, it makes you nervous to hope again. Go to Ephesians chapter 3 in your Bibles. Uh, the text that I want to share with you, and I'm going to try and keep things moving, uh, which usually means I'm going to have to cut out a lot, right? So if you have questions afterward, you'll, you'll delight me if you ask them. 
If you're wondering if it's a bother to the preacher to talk to him about his sermon afterward because you want more of it, you'll never discourage him, just so you know, all right? Ever. All right, Ephesians chapter 3. Now, I want you to look at it. Maybe it's on your phone. This is the part where I like a physical Bible because I'm a visual guy. And so for me, I've got Ephesians chapter 3 open. I'll tell you what, the breeze feels good, but it didn't exist until I started preaching. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, for me, I've got it open on two pages so I can visualize this, but I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 3. No takers, you can jot this down if you want, but know this. You have to divide Ephesians chapter 3 in half to understand it. You really do. And so section number 1 goes from verses 1 through 13, and section number 2 goes from 14 to 21. Section number one ends at 13. Section number two starts at verse 14. When does section number one end? Oh, good. You passed 50% so far. When does section number two start? Good. That's 100%. One more question. I will make it worth thirds, okay? What is the main verse? In Ephesians chapter 3, it's verse 6. So let me just give you the context because I want to spend my time in chapter 14 through 21. But I want you to understand the entire chapter because it's such a rich text. I told Cherry, man, do I wish that I was able to write like the Holy Spirit had Paul write this text. No one writes at this level. No one. And there are some really great authors out there. In the first couple verses of... Ephesians chapter 3, he introduces us to the concept of dispensations. You say, what are dispensations? God has worked with and through mankind in different ways in different ages. And when you understand that he is working in different ways and in different ages, it helps us understand what we would think are the rule changes. Like, for instance, why are we able to worship on Sunday and not Saturday? because Saturday is Sabbath, and the Ten Commandments say to keep the Sabbath holy, to maintain it. You'd say, well, that was for that dispensation. Those were the rules for that time. you say, what time was that? It was the time of the law. It was the Mosaic law when man lived. By the way, have you ever wondered this? If you lived in the Old Testament and you're not a Jew, how do you become a child of God? How do you get saved and go to heaven? You have to be a Jew. You have to abide by the law and convert, convert to being a Jew. And they had a process for it, but it was the only way. So then salvation was only in Israel. And so Paul says, in this dispensation, we've been entrusted. And he used the word mystery. Look at verse 3. He says, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote a four in few words. Does anybody else like immediately go, ooh, what is the secret? Warren Wearsby in his commentary calls this the sacred secret. I know, that's good. He says in verse 4, whereby when, you, when ye read, uh, you may understand, uh, when ye read, sorry, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. There it is again. He says in verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it was now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. We are the guys that get the sacred secret and we get to share it with you. You say, what's the sacred secret? You'd probably overlook it if I didn't tell you that the center of chapter 3 is verse 6 because to you it's not that miraculous. But wait until you hear what Paul has to say about your salvation. Here it is, the sacred secret found in verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Again, by the way, he mentions the word mystery in verse 9 to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. What is the mystery? It is that you can be God's child through adoption, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things. Now I want you to see verse 10. This gives you a taste of how excited Paul is about people being able to get saved. Look at verse 10. I'll read it, see if you can understand it. To the intent that now under the principalities and power in heavenly 
uh, places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. You say, I don't know what that means, but it sounded really good. Let's break it down. The intent literally means the purpose. So look at verse 10. To the purpose that now under principalities and powers. Who are principalities and powers, church family? Who are principalities and powers? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Do you know what principalities and powers are? Whenever scripture uses that term, it's describing angels, fallen or unfallen. And Paul identifies the principalities and powers are not the fallen angels. They're the heavenly ones. They're the ones that didn't fall. So he says, the purpose of the mystery, working in the angels so that they might know the manifold wisdom of God through the church. Where do the angels live? Grandma Rosie, I saw you mouth it perfectly. With, with God in heaven. What is the best way to know the wisdom of God? To be in heaven with him. Wrong. The best way to know the wisdom of God is to understand the way the gospel works in men. And angels have a deeper appreciation for the almighty nature of God, not because of what they're seeing there, but because of what they get to see here. That's what Paul says. He says that they would know the wisdom of God because they don't get to experience it. They can only study it. So they watch it. And for them, it's confusing, maybe even peculiar, but they see the goodness of God. When you accept Christ as Savior, let me ask you, when did you ask Jesus to save you? When did you repent? We know that heaven celebrated that day. But Paul goes on in Ephesians chapter 3 to talk about why that is such a big deal. Why you and I must be in love with our salvation. We pick up in verse number 11, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. Verse 14, for this cause, I bow my knees to the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Paul talks about this moment in Philippians chapter two, one of my favorite passages in all of scripture. Paul says a day is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that at the mention of the name of Jesus, everyone will fall down and worship. Now, it feels kind of weird right now, me sitting, preaching. But did you know that when Jesus was alive, if a man taught in the temple, he sat while everyone stood. Did you know that? You guys want to be more biblical today? It was because to sit is a posture of honor and respect and dignity. And to stand is to recognize that there's one that should be. Interesting. That the only position creation can find when Jesus' name is mentioned is face down on the floor. That's how awesome he is. And Paul says, it's the mystery. It's the mystery. It's not just him, but what he did and who he did it for that makes all of this so good to get to write about. That in the context of Hollywood and Facebook and Twitter and the Fortune 500 and world history, there is no statement that has been greater in all of mankind than that you have become a child of God. That is the mystery of all ages. And Warren Wearsby calls it the most sacred secret. And it is understanding what it means to be saved that gives us four hopes. Now, there's a lot more hope than just four, but here's four that Paul lists. And there's probably a couple different ways to look at it, but think of it like a rocket with four stages. And we are headed into the stratosphere today. Stage number one. So he says in verse 14, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Salvation brings hope. Verse number 16, 
face number one of our hope, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Let's just pause for a second to the riches of his glory. Can we think about that? Man, we are thanking God for gravel today. What are some things we could have done to make this nicer? Well, we didn't because resources are limited. Would a Corvette be a big deal if every single person got one for their 18th birthday? See, we live in a world where things are unreachable, untouchable, or unattainable, but there's nothing out of reach for God. We're happy to have 11 acres. God could make it 100. You're happy to have $1,000 in your checking account at the end of the month. God could make it a million. You see, for God, resources aren't shorthanded. And so Paul says, according to the riches of all of his glory, that he would strengthen you. Look at it in verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. It's one of those things about a new believer that is so thrilling to watch because they're stronger than they know. Man, I worked with guys that tried to quit smoking I've worked with people that have tried to quit drinking. And yet I'd say the highest success rate I have ever seen in my 39 years of being alive is when a person accepts Christ for the first time. I, I have watched over and over again. I have seen, I, I will never forget. There was a, a family that had been attending and one of their young family members, she was 22 years old, was hospitalized over drug use. She had overdosed. And she had overdosed so badly that it destroyed one of the valves in her heart and that broke loose and caused a stroke. She was laying there getting ready to die. And the family said, the only reason that I was able to come, because I, I didn't know I went, I wanted to pray for her. We had heard the prayer request and I thought, I'm going to the hospital. So I went and I prayed over her and one of the family members, one of the non-church going family members said, Pastor, if she knew that you were in here praying over her, she'd throw you out right now. And the only reason you're able to do this is because she is unconscious. When she woke up and they told her that I had prayed over her, she was livid. She would sneak out. She had paralysis on half of her body. She would still, she would sneak out and, um, and go, go smoke while she's dying of a drug overdose. They'd come into her room and she would have hobbled out to the exit or she'd hide. She'd find closets to hide in so she could keep smoking. She had so many addictions. I wouldn't have known where to begin other than to simply give her the gospel. So when she agreed to come in and talk to me, I was shocked and I gave her the gospel. At 22 years old, this girl accepted Christ. I followed up with her a week later because I figured, okay, now we've really got to get to work because she's got these drug addictions. I mean, she came in on a cane because her body, a beautiful 22-year-old woman, had to use a cane because of the stroke that she had had. She was disabled for the rest of her life. Had artificial valves, was patched together with surgeries. Half of her face drooped. So I reached out to her and asked her, how's it going? Good. Have you had any struggles with anything? Oh, no, I quit all that stuff that day. Have you ever seen that before? When a brand new Christian does the impossible, you say, what happened? It's that strength they didn't know they had. It's like when a 10-year-old when a, when a boy becomes a 14-year-old man. Have you ever seen that? And they're like six foot tall, and they're all arms and legs. I remember I was in the youth group. I hated that when they'd hit their growth spurt because they'd almost inevitably hurt me because they were stronger than they realized. Paul says that if you're born again, you have the power of God inside you. You remember what that was like in those early days as a Christian? Nothing scared you. Nothing stopped you. I remember as a kid running through the neighborhood, just, I got to tell everyone about Jesus. And so I would make children, a seven, I would make all the kids sit down and hear the gospel. And then one by one, I'd make every one of them pray and ask Jesus into their heart. I didn't understand the whole free will concept. I just figured if you make them, you're good. And I don't want anyone to go to hell. I would ask you right now to go to your neighbors and force them to hear the gospel. You say, oh, well, pastor, I, I can't do that. Right, because young Christians are strong. 
And they don't realize, like, how is this all working? I don't know, but you can't stop me right now. Never have to convince a brand new Christian to read the Bible or pray. They're overwhelmed by the strength that is in them. And he says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Born again Christians, do you believe that you're strong in Christ? We have living evidences, living proofs of it all over the place. I look over here to Nicole and I look back here to the forces. And I tell you, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The same word that's used in this passage was used of these two families. That's a flat out miracle. The celebration when Nicole came back to service, the celebration when Ron and Bev came to church and the celebration we'll have when Tom and Holly come back to service maybe next week. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If it's what God wants, Satan can't stop it. He wants to use you to accomplish it. Yeah, I know that person is probably one of the worst people you know. And yeah, I know you're not good at talking in front of people. And yeah, I know you've tried before. But what you don't know is that God wants to use you to reach that person. Strengthened with might in the inner man. Here's a question. Why? <laughs> why are Christians strong? Well, I'm really glad you asked that question because if we keep reading, we get to stage number two of blast off as we hope in Jesus. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. I wrote it down this way. Imagine a brand new Christian confronting Satan and kicking out the worst habits in their life. And in one day, it's gone. I remember my parents telling me that they had habits and patterns in their life that in one day, in one day of accepting Jesus, it was gone. Imagine the brand new Christian overwhelmed with his strength says, oh boy, where did that strength come from? Paul says, a voice breaks the silence and says, that came from me. And his name is Jesus. And when the silence is broken and you say, man, where did that strength come from? And you hear a voice say me, and it's the voice of Jesus. It's not from without, but from within for Christ lives in us. Phase number two. You're strong because Christ lives in you. And if you're not sure how strong you are, read the Gospels. I love that passage where he comes up to the maniacs just outside of Gadara, and before he could say a word, they're begging, please, please don't judge us yet because they know that a judgment is reserved for them where they'll be thrown into the bottomless pit. They know that it's coming. And so the demons cry out, please, son of God, have mercy on us. Can you believe that? Even the demons pray for God's mercy. This is the one who lives inside you. They, they, they plead for a reprave, but he calls you friend. Come on now, that's good. No, that's not good. That's great. I know I'm not able to walk around and get you all hooped up, but could I please, please get an amen to that thought? Amen. Testify. God living in you. And they beg, please have mercy on us. And he does. He casts them into swine. What do they do? They flee from him and jump off a cliff. That's how afraid they are of he that is in you. Oh, that you would be strengthened with this mystery known as being born again. And that you would know where that strength comes from. You don't know it? Read the Gospels. If they would shake and tremble, is it a wonder that Jesus says, greater things will you do in my name than I have done in front of you? And you have not because you ask not. You ask not because you believe not. Paul says it's, front and center stage, and you're the main actor. 
So phase number one is this strength. Phase number two is where this strength comes from, Jesus. You say, well, why would he do that? I'm so glad you asked that question. He answers it with the second half of verse number 17. You guys are good at questions today. Why would Jesus do this for me? Because there was a cost to have Jesus living in you. You know that, right? What was the cost? Renee, say it. Somebody else say it. Say it again. Tortured on the cross. Spit, beaten, ripped to pieces. Almighty God in flesh. Never harmed, never hurt, only forgave, only showed kindness and taught truth. Shredded to pieces on the cross. Nailed to wood and hung there for people to laugh at. It's expensive. That's what it cost for him to live in us. He had to give up his life. So you and I could have his strength. Why? Why would you do this? That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, depth, and height. How many dimensions are there? If you've never heard this before, this is cool. If you've heard it, it should never get old. How many dimensions are there? Three, Three X, Y, and Z. There are, there's X and Y, which is the flat plane, and Z, which is the third dimension. Whatever space you're in, there's only three dimensions. And scientists have hypothesized over the concept of a fourth dimension, but no one has ever been able to prove that one exists. And yet Paul says, Jesus loves you in every direction in four dimensions. You say, Pastor, what's that fourth dimension? I don't know. <laughs> it's unspeakably good. That I could talk about Jesus loving me as far in that direction as I could go. You think about how far it is to Lake Michigan. He loves me more than that. Past Wisconsin. You guys, he loves me past California. All the way back around to this side. In every direction, I cannot run from the love of Jesus Christ. It is infinite and inexhaustible. And then you can go up. How high? Until there's no air, keep going. How high then? I don't know, keep going. You cannot find the end of the love of Jesus. There is nothing you will do where Jesus will say, I am burnt out on loving them. And that's why you're filled with this indescribable strength. Because it's Jesus in you, and he loves you. And he says that you being rooted and grounded in love. That's a cool word. Because all of a sudden we realize that love isn't an emotion. It's a verifiable choice, a decision, and a fact. If there's anyone that has proven that love is something other than feelings, it's Jesus because he still loves you. You've given him every reason not to. But he says, I'll still love you. Because what is love? Sacrifice for the benefit of another. To what degree? Well, with Jesus, there's no end. And so be rooted and grounded in it. You are a child of God, not because you feel like it, but because Jesus laid down the price to make it happen. And you'll know that one day when you see the scars. Be rooted and grounded in love. Man, is that good. Pastor Matt, that's good. I need you to pace around for me a little bit. It's so good. I was working on the golf course years ago. You with me? Everyone perks up for story time. I was working on the golf course years ago when I was in high school. And we had a windstorm come through that... No one saw a tornado, so we don't know, but it was in the middle of the night. It was probably a tornado. And on a golf course where there's nothing but trees and little yellow sticks and holes with sand, the trees take the beating. We had over 100 trees, all larger than these over here and as big as this one back here laid down. 
there was this one tree in one of the, wa- the wettest spots on the golf course. It was, a, it was an evergreen of some kind, pine tree or whatever. And someone said, hey, did you see the tree on number three? And I said, no, down on the bottom? We called it the swamp because it was a swamp and they built it up and put a golf course there. By the way, I found out how they built it up. They didn't bring in good dirt. They brought in a bunch of sand because they said, you got to go see this tree. I went down and I looked and you guys, the root structure on that tree was probably 15, maybe even 18 feet across, maybe more. I don't want to exaggerate it. But when the winds blew, the roots were shallow and it literally ripped right out of the ground and just the whole thing dumped right over. We, we hypothesized if we could stand this 60 foot tree back up and prop it up, it'd probably be perfectly fine because all the roots were right at the surface. When we looked, it was, there, there were no roots that had broken off because they hadn't gone deep. For some of you, that describes your salvation. Man, you don't ever think about the love of God and the love of God never consumes you so that you love him more than everything else in the world. Because if I don't think about it, it won't change me. And so your salvation is like this. And so when Satan comes and blows on you, you fall over. Why? Because you're not anchored in a love of Jesus Christ. Man, the pandemic hits, God's not in control. A failure in my life, I'm not born again. Know the love of God. It's not a feeling. That's just the surface. It's a fact and it goes deep. Please read the Gospels. Study the love of God. See, this mystery, as Paul describes, was kept from man all the way back in the garden. But it's not a mystery anymore. It's not being withheld from men. It's become a mystery because we don't care. And so in verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts, stage number two, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, stage number three, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breath Length, depth, and height. Is that not enough for you? Testify. Isn't that enough? Yeah, it is. Person gets saved and they've got all this strength they weren't expecting. You say, but where did all of this come from? And Jesus breaks the silence and says, oh, that's me. And you realize that he's saying it not from without, but from within. And you ask Jesus, why would you do this? And he says, because I love you. And you ask, well, then what happens to me? Because Paul describes this as the greatest mystery ever withheld since the beginning of the garden, what's about to happen in you. So what is it? Well, I'm glad you asked. You guys are so good at asking questions. Verse 19. To know the love of Christ, the continuation of phase number three. Phase number three's got a little bit more gas in it. When he writes it, it's got a little bit more fuel. That stage lasts just a little bit more than all the others when Paul writes. Why? Because it's so important that you acknowledge that Jesus loves you and he's worthy of your love. Amen. There you go. We'll get you there. So he burns off the last little bit of fuel in that stage and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. For what purpose? That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's why the unsaved are supposed to look at us without us saying a word and say, I want what you have. What is that? Oh, well, it's... It's the fullness of God. Say, well, what is the fullness of God? All of it. Holiness, power, might, forgiveness, patience, all of it. And he says, how do we access this? By the love of Jesus, by loving him? By being full of Christ? By having strength? By being born again. You hear me. It is the single most important moment in anyone's life when they cry out and say, save me. So how come you never think about it? That's why it's still a mystery. 
because it's happening center stage. The greatest work of God in the greatest experiences of mankind, being a child of God, being Gentile and being in heaven forever. You don't deserve to be there, but you will be if you've asked Jesus to save you. And that is a big deal. And thank God for it. And start celebrating it every day. You say, Pastor, what's that going to do? <laughs> Hang on for the rocket ride. You'll start growing in ways you never have. It's really simple. It really is. Because the gospel is simple. Jesus matters. And he's all that matters. Why? Well, he died for me. Why did he die for me? Because he loves me. And it's changed me. It's made me strong. And now I love him back. And God says, now we're getting there. You say, what, what, what happens in the end? Like, what, 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 what's the guarantee? What's the hope? Remember what I said at the beginning? Have you ever hoped for something that you were disappointed in? The whole point of Ephesians chapter 3 is that you will not be disappointed. It's the whole point. And it's a challenge. Take God at his word. Say, what happens in the end, pastor? What's the paycheck? Is it $500 bonus? It is all the fullness of God in you. And that was just a question whether or not you actually want that. Only been alive 39 years. But I've seen enough to know that there ain't nothing out there that's as good as what's being offered right here. And that's just where I'm at. And so it's time to fall in love with when that seven-year-old boy said yes. Man, thank God that seven-year-old boy said yes. How old were you? Miraculous. Incredible. Everybody's. The divine, sacred secret. The mystery without end. The day you got saved. Father, thank you for the message today, for giving us hope. That, Lord, when tragedy strikes unexpectedly, you are enough. That difficult circumstances not only test our faith, but they develop it. And so as we have said before amongst each other, we are in a rapid seasoning process. Father, we don't have time to be carnal anymore. The world around us can't afford it. And so help us to understand that it starts with being in love with the fact that you saved us miraculously. Help us never to get over that thought. And that, Father, if there is anybody here that is confused as to whether or not they're a child of God, that today you would, they would accept your love and experience your strength as you give them all of the fullness of God. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today, and I'll just briefly tell you my own story. I was seven years old. I knew that God existed. I had heard about Jesus, but I had no clue how it all worked. I found out that he died on the cross. And then when he died, he died as God who had never sinned. And the natural question is, well, then why did he die? And the answer is because of my sin. When I was seven years old, I, I asked God, please forgive me. Everything changed that day everything because I became a part of God's family. Are you a part of God's family? Have you cried out? You'd say, I've never done that, but I want to today. Would you raise your hand with no one else looking? I'll pray for you and you can start that commitment. It's a courageous step to reach out and say, I don't want sin in my life. I want God in my life. But I am telling you, there is nothing. There is nothing that will meet this need the way that the gospel does. And so if you're here, and you want to ask Jesus into your heart, I want to help you. Let's go ahead and start the process. Just raise your hand high enough for me to see it and say, I'm going to pray right now and ask Jesus to save me. I've never done this before. I don't care if you've been in church your entire life. Your soul rests on this. Right now, raise your hand. Say, Pastor, right now. Just high enough for me to see no one else. Eyes closed. I'm going to pray right now and ask Jesus into my heart. Anybody? Father, as we close this service, I pray that we would be convicted about our value system and that we would start restructuring our lives to feed this great mystery, 
that we would not only meditate on it and think about it, but that we would allow your spirit to change what we're doing now knowing these things. Because no one can handle this truth and not be changed by it. And so we pray for not only step number one, but step number two in all of our lives. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to close the service just a little bit differently today. I would encourage you, if you've never asked Jesus into your heart, you say, sometimes, Pastor, I could tell you're hitting it hard. Why are you hitting it hard today? Because of the topic of the message, which is stop taking salvation for granted. I think some of you may be pretending, and that scares me for you. And it's why you have no strength of Jesus in your life, because you just want to pretend like you're a born-again Christian. Yesterday, um, Brother Mark Samples texted me at 7.30 in the evening and said, would you call me please? Doesn't matter what time it is when you get this. And I had been studying and I had set my phone to the side. It was on silent and I didn't realize it. I picked up my phone at about 11.30-ish, almost midnight, right when we were headed to bed. And I picked up my phone and I saw that text. And so I called him. Or I texted him and I said, are you still up? I'm so sorry, I didn't, I didn't see it till now. And just, yes. So I called him and I could tell by the tone in his, in his voice that there was news that we weren't expecting that was coming. Mark has three sisters and he's been raised and trained and taught their princesses. And um, his oldest sister, Melody, is in her mid-50s. And uh, she, she died yesterday very unexpectedly. And so Mark told me over the phone, um, Melody is with Jesus and they've treated us like family already. So uh, that hit really hard. Had a rough night last night praying for pastor and Mrs. Samples. Uh, they, Melody lives with them at home. And from what I understand, she passed away in her bedroom but I will tell you this, and this, this will be a part of this family. I told Cherry, as a born-again Christian, I have, to, I have to change the way I think. Because it's like, oh, it was, her life was cut short, and I weep over that. No, it wasn't. She finished her race. She was never intended to live to 60. She was midlife by 25, and I will tell you, she served God with her entire life, her whole life. It's so, it's difficult because she didn't get to say, see you later. That was the thought that I had that troubled me all night last night. But I will tell you this, she is with Christ. Pastor Samples, I, I made a slip up years ago when I was with him down in Georgia and I said, oh yeah, you know, we lost them. And he goes, were they saved? I said, yeah, they were saved, but you know, because you want to say when someone dies, you want to say it the nicest way you possibly can. And so I was saying, you know, we lost them. And he goes, they were saved? And I said, yeah. He goes, then you never lost them. You only lose something if you don't know where it is. Don't ever say that again. And he's a pastor, so he can talk to me like that. And he got me. When Mark called me yesterday, he didn't say my sister died. He said, my sister is with Jesus. And there was a lot of shock there. I didn't even know what to say or do. Mark was going to come today, but he had a rough night last night and prayed on it. And he and I agreed. Uh, be too hard for him to be here today. But I want you to know why. He said, church is all about God. It's not all about me. And if I'm there, everyone will make it all about me. He said, so would you do me a favor? I have a request. Mark doesn't say that often. He said, I don't want you to say anything about it until service is over. I said, can I say it immediately after I get done preaching? He goes, well, you're pastor if you think that's the best time. But... I don't want people to be focused on it while they're worshiping. We'll be all right. God's going to take care of us. So my hope is to get down there to be with the family. I want to go. I, I know Melody well, love the family. And so I plan on going and I can take your love and affection with you. I don't know any details yet. There's, there's a lot that's unknown. We're not even sure what happened. And so all I ask is that you be praying. No need to ask questions. You can send Mark your love. I'm sure you'd appreciate that. Go ahead and text him if you want and tell him, 
hey, we love you and we're praying for you. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't treat him like he has the plague. Um, but we need to be praying for their family. This is a, this is a tough blow. And, and, um, and I think many of you are close enough to Mark and their family. They've come and visited here and Pastor Samples has preached in the pulpit and obviously Melody has visited. Um, it really does feel like a family member has gone to be with Jesus. And so we'll be loving from a distance, all right? And I don't have any, if you have questions, I don't have any answers yet. And we'll share with you what we can when it's appropriate, all right? So with that said, I want to close the service differently. I told Mark, I said, Mark, do you know what I'm preaching on tomorrow? I said, I'm preaching on hope. And he goes, well, that's the perfect message. <laughs> and I was, we were singing this song, and I was so moved. I was like, wow. Paul, you picked the perfect song today, sir. This is the very first one. So I got my piano players over there. I need the song leader up here. Brother Paul is going to come and lead us in number 63. Take the name of Jesus with you. It's hard on the family, and it's sad because they don't get to see Melody. But hey, listen, we do not sorrow as those which have no hope. She's with Jesus, and we'll be together one day. That day is going to come sooner than we expect. I'm sure of that. It'll come sooner than, than I think we could imagine. But we'll all be together, and life is a vapor. And so number 63, I just want to read these words. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it everywhere you go. Precious name, oh, how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh, how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Brother Paul, would you please come and lead us in this song and then close us in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time that we had here this morning. Thank you for the beautiful weather you gave us to be able to be here. Father, we thank you for your blessings in our lives. We just pray that you would give uh, Mark and his family uh, strength at this time. And, Lord, to uh, praise and honor and glorify you for the life of uh, Mark's sister. Lord, we just pray that you would uh, bless them, uplift them, let you be honored and glorified in all things. Father, we ask that you would just give us a good day today. Keep us safe as we go our way. Bring us back again at the appointed time. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.